Okay, guys, let's jump in. Let's see, we left off at Matthew 23, I think, uh, verse 25. I don't know him. Hi, fella. Uh, this is fella. This is Phil. Adam. Wait. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Adam. Adam. Hi, nice Adam. Hi, <coughs> I'm more today. When it's left over. <laughs> generally presented as a very passive, blank face, passive, and uh, non-confronted, let's just put it that way. That is not, that is not Christ. That is not Jesus Christ. There is no, huh? I was going to ask, who are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Love, that, that's what everybody in yes. the 60s, that uh, And a lot of that came out, that philosophy came out of the 18th century. Which uh, yeah, the, uh, theologians back in the let's just say the 1800s started writing in about 1850. Mm -hmm. Around 1850 and forward, the uh, theologians and most theologians in that day came from Germany. Uh, we're talking about the top level theologians. Okay? They many of them didn't even believe that Jesus existed. You got to understand this. Archaeology was not um, a primary focus of the day. So most of the texts, for instance, the text of the King James Version, the earliest text at that time was probably only about A.D. 1200. Their view of the Bible was it's just a bunch of made-up stuff over the years. And there are still people, by the way, that hold to that, especially liberal theologians will hold to that. When archaeology took off, we now have manuscripts that go back to A.D. 200 to 300. Within a hundred years of Jesus. Now that still sounds terrible to us. It's about a hundred years of Jesus. That still sounds terrible. The earliest manuscripts we have about Caesar go back to around right here. Does anybody doubt that Caesar, Julius Caesar, existed? Uh, uh, and then the writings of some of the great ancient philosophers, like Socrates, Plato, things like that. Those writings basically were about right here because there was no printing press before that time. So almost everything had to be copied from generation to generation. And many times the texts that they copied from were so old that they destroyed them. They just burnt them. Okay. Especially, especially uh, religious texts uh, because there was a view that you did not want to have something that could be mishandled. Text, Bibles were not owned by individual people. Bibles were generally chained to the pulpit in most churches. One Bible would be chained to a pulpit, and that would be it for that particular area. And maybe some of the some of the libraries, like Vatican Library, could still held on to some of the old texts. And that's when they found these. They found this. Some they, <laughs> the one they found in one of the monasteries, which went back to 200 B.C., uh, 200 A.D. of the New Testament was being used as insulation in the walls. They had taken the, the, this old manuscript apart and it was stuffed in the walls. Okay, That's Sinaitic. I think that's Sinaitic. It's the story of Sinaitic, which is one of the oldest manuscripts we have. And it's a good thing they stuffed them in the walls <laughs> because then we recovered them. And then they were able to see it. There's very little variance. We were talking about this earlier. There's very little variance in terms of what we have in the, our modern translation. In fact, it's most of the modern translations now are based on these. And what was here in 1200, which is what King James Version was. That was a Sinaiticus? Sinaiticus, I think, was used as insulation in the wall. I can't... I'm, I, I, that could be wrong. I'm just pulling stuff up from memory. Yeah. One of them was that. Vaticanus was found in the Vatican Library. I know it wasn't even being used as uh, being used as insulation. So the archaeologists, I love archaeologists. Many of them are unbelievers. They're just scientists. 
They dig up this stuff, and all it does is confirm the reality of Jesus Christ, confirms the realities of the Bible, because the Bible mentions all these places and times and people and governors and things like that. If you were just making something up and you didn't know anything about history, which these guys were not historians, these guys were, sort of, Amos was a shepherd, right? Uh, the, the disciples of Jesus who wrote the New Testament were all fishermen. Some of them were uh, totally uneducated. They had to speak what they remembered, and then somebody educated would write it down. So it was really interesting that th those places literally exist. Uh, they recently found some. The reason I'm driving at this is because, again, let's go back to what I was driving at. The picture in the early 50s of the movies of Jesus is this sort of blank-faced, nice-looking, but blank-faced person who never offended anybody and always said, love your neighbors yourself, love people, this kind of thing. And the Bible presents Jesus Christ indeed as a person who's moved with compassion, has great love for people. There's no doubt about that. But he is, let's just say, he's highly activated. Okay? And if he sees something wrong, he says it. So we're in the middle of Jesus talking about what we call the seven woes. They're called the seven woes. And they are to the religious leaders of that day who are leading people away from God. Instead of leading people towards God, they are leading people towards themselves. Uh, you know, when I hear somebody say, I want to leave a great legacy, I said, are you, con are you more concerned about your legacy and how history remembers you, or are you concerned about the American people? You know, this, when I hear that, I go, goodness gracious, have we lost our direction as a nation that our leaders are more interested in their own leg my own legacy versus what is right and what is wrong. So Jesus did, hits these people directly because they are more interested in themselves, what people think of them, how good they look, how religious they look. So we talked about this last week, that uh, Jews still today, if you're a committed Jew, a conservative Jew, you will wear phylacteries, and you have phylacteries around the house. Phylacteries are little boxes, I should have brought one, little boxes like this that had scriptures, and we talked about where the scriptures were. They made a big, so they, one was on their forehead, one was on their left arm, and then they also had them on their doorways, so that if you walk into their door, I don't know, you know, I've never seen anybody use these things, but, uh, I mean, open them up and read them, but they would carry these scriptures in boxes on their forehead and on their arm. Uh, and Jesus said, you, you know, you do all these things, you carry your Bible around, on your forehead, but you don't do them. You, you don't read them. You don't think about them. So that's where we sort of left off last week. This is a tough chapter for those who say that Jesus taught, do not judge. judge that's not. right. Yes. And there's some interesting things that when you read them, you go, I'm, you know, I read it and I go, I've never seen that before. I still read it and go, whoa. So, Although Jesus, remember the book of Matthew was written to Jewish Christians in about 65, to, and uh, that's a conservative view, to about 80 AD, that's a liberal view. Uh, around 65 AD, in my opinion, around 65 AD, and the whole nation is falling apart. The government's falling apart. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, social services are falling apart. Uh, public works are falling apart. Everything's falling apart. Okay, and they know the the uh, they have been told that the Roman legions are en route to destroy the whole land. They're going to level everything. So Matthew is getting his disciples ready, and he writes down. Remember, Matthew at this point is probably about seventy years old. He knows that he and his fellow disciples, the original disciples of Jesus are dying off. And so the most important thing is to write down their memoirs of Jesus. So this is the memoirs of Matthew written to Jewish Christians to help them through this time of where society is falling apart. And they're going to be scattered all over the world, just like the rest of the Jews were for 2,000 years, almost. 
So let's let's pick up there. Uh, however, when I read this, another thing I'm driving at. However, when I read this, I say, how does it apply to us today? None of us are Pharisees. None of us are Sadducees. None of us are high priests. None of us are any of these people Jesus is talking to. But there are some relevant things here. It means that that we are. I'll put it this way: we're being watched. God is everywhere. For God to be God, He is in all points in time and space. He's spirit. He's not flesh and blood. He's not limited like we are. The Bible even says in the Psalms, I love this picture in the Psalms, it says that God literally has to humble himself and bend down just to examine our universe. There's a, there's a passage in the Psalms that basically says that. I think that is so, obviously God doesn't have a physical body, but it is a beautiful metaphor of how great God is that he, um, he humbles himself to look down on his creation and he can see things down on the atomic and subatomic level because he's God. He is not us. Uh, most other religions project humanity up on their view of deity. So when you, look at, when you look at the picture of the gods of other religions, you will see a big human being. Very strong, very mad, generally very angry, like the gods of the Greeks. Or you'll see a pantheon of millions and billions of gods, like in India. But if you look at them, they look like animals, they look like plants, they look like monkeys, they look like, you know, they look like half human, half monkey, half human, half donkey, half human, half elephant. Maybe that's what the Republican Democrat Party are, half human, half elephant. I don't know. So, but they have all of these gods that they worship, and they're just simply upward projections of themselves. In fact, is that is so widespread that if you watch the History Channel like I do, you will see that they their view of God is that God is just an alien from another planet who's bigger and stronger than we are, more advanced, and this alien came to the world, and people were so impressed by what he did, they call him God. I'm telling you, that's the modern view of what God is. But if you read the Bible, you will see that God is far vaster than anything because he's not a thing. He is spirit. Let's just put it, that way. put it that way. So Jesus is tying into these leaders of the Jewish faith who are leading their people away, astray from God, who God is. And he's pointing this out. So let's pick up uh, in verse 25. Woe to you teachers of the Law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside is full of greed and indulgence. Jesus is using a metaphor of the way they acted. We talked about the Talmud. There's not really anything in the, our Bible that describes this kind of behavior. But in the Talmud, they were very interested in whether something was physically clean, because if it wasn't physically clean on the outside... Or, or inside, uh, if, if their silverware wasn't physically clean, then that was a taint on their morality. They were sinners because they didn't wash their dishes. Okay, I think I know some people that are like. I'm going to hell. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking of my grandparents. Uh, I, on one side of my family, I had a grandparent that let us kids do just anything. She loved us all. But on the other side was a grandparent who we knew that when we got there, we couldn't touch anything. There was everything that was made out of uh, China, things like that. You couldn't touch it. You better not, because if you break, you're going to catch it forever. You know, that kind of thing. So we were very little angelic beings over at Grandma's house. Number two grandma. But uh, number one grandma, though, cousins had a great time. We had a blast. We were running everywhere and having a great time. So that is, that, that's your sort of view of religion, that you were violating some sort of moral principle if you touched, some, uh, touched something or made it unclean, physically. And Jesus said, you're so meticulous about washing your dishes making sure that your clothes are clean. And there's nothing, by the way, there's nothing wrong with these things. But they had made it a moral proposition. Do you see the difference? They measured people's spirituality based on how clean their clothes were. So I remember back when the first hippie ever walked into our church back in the 60s. 
I could see <laughs> the deacons were a little upset. Had to calm them down. <laughs> okay. Had to calm them down a little bit. I just listen, these people are hungry for the Lord. I know they smell bad. I know they look bad. I know they they they, they probably were on drugs last night and all this kind of stuff. But they're they're hungry for God. Let's let's love them into the kingdom. You don't have to get too close to them, but at least smile at them. <laughs> you know, I just I, you, you, it, we had to take things step by step in those days because it was a totally different thing to see this kind of behavior coming to the church. They indeed were unclean. Jesus is saying, you made religious so physically clean that you've forgotten about your, your spiritual duties. He says right here, he says, but inside, notice he's comparing them to the cups that they clean. You're so busy making yourself look like a clean cup on the outside you don't know that on the inside of you is greed and, and self-indulgence. In other words, uh, look, you know, everybody worship me. Uh, I'm going to satisfy myself. I'm worried about my, <laughs> my legacy. Uh, and full of greed, wanting things. Blind Pharisees. First clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside also will be clean. He's using this metaphor that let God... Let God make you righteous on the outside, and you will want to look better on the outside. Uh, let God make you better on the inside, and it will change your outward behavior. This is a, isn't this the message of Paul? If you read Romans, his whole thing is, is be spiritually transformed. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The spiritual transformation of our mind, our soul, our body... Uh, inner person, and it's going to change our outward behavior as well. Rather than trying to do things right, let God so fill and flood your life on the inside, you're so much in love with him, that you'll automatically want to do what's right. So Jesus, Jesus is talking about this life of grace right here. You will be transformed on the outside. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything else that is unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as very righteous, very good, all these things, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So, in Jesus' day, when millions of pilgrims would come into Jerusalem, there were tombs all over the place. Uh, remember, at this time, Jerusalem and the Jewish people had been living there a thousand, oh, pardon me, uh, 1,100 years. So there had been a lot of people who had been born, and a lot of people who wanted to be buried in Jerusalem. Jews still consider that a very high and holy act in Judaism is when a person dies to be buried in Israel. So they'll have their bodies put on a plane and flown to Israel and buried there because that is a... I guess that's a wonderful thing to do. You know, I go, okay, wherever you die, you're going to die, you're going to go to the earth. And when Jesus comes back, he says he's going to even pull bodies out of the ocean. So it's not going to make any difference uh, as far as I'm concerned. But that, that is a mental picture there. There are all of these tombs all over the place. And they're not like ours with big headstones. People are buried everywhere. They're buried in the ground, buried, uh, you know, uh, under a tree in the Old Testament. They'd be buried under a Aberrant tree, whatever that is, uh, buried under the roots of a tree. They would be buried in various places, caves, things like that. And these pilgrims coming in wouldn't know where they were. And remember, if you touch the dead body, what does the Old Testament say? You are unclean. And here they're at the Passover. They're only, you're unclean for like two or three weeks, okay? But, but the Passover is only about three days long. You won't be able to go into the temple if you're unclean. You won't be able to do anything unclean. So what they would do is they would go out and they would whitewash all the tombs as a warning not to step close to this. We don't, we don't have that kind of stuff. I mean, I like going to the uh, graveyard where my mom and dad are buried. And I'm sure that most of you have that same uh, inner draw uh, to commemorate in some way the, the influence they had on your lives. 
So we don't think about the fact that if you touch a tombstone or touch a grave, you're going to be unclean. Spiritually, that makes no sense. Jesus is talking about the fact that these people are so committed to some religious ideology of clean and unclean and all this kind of stuff by touching physical things or getting close to something physical. Jesus is saying, you're so interested in that that you don't realize that you are that grave, that you are unclean. Okay? Even though you've whitewashed the outside, you look pretty. Okay? You look pretty on the outside, but people ought to avoid you because you are full of dead men. He says full of dead men's bones, which basically was saying you're unclean. Okay? You got the, the idea there? So, uh, let's go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Woe to you teachers of the law. You build the tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. Now, obviously, when you build a tomb and decorate the grave, you're going to be unclean yourself for so many days. So they would do this between their major festivals. There are three major festivals to the Jews. There are seven in all together, but there are three major ones that they had to go to. So, so they, would, they knew they would be uh, ceremonially unclean, not spiritually unclean, ceremonially unclean. They wouldn't be able to participate in the ceremonies. For a, for a short period of time. And that's when they would do all this decoration. Whitewash the tombs, uh, clear it up. Um, not one of my direct relatives, but somebody's married to a relative of mine. Uh, their child died, which is, you know, it's always a tragedy. And they live in Houston. They had come up here to a small, one of the smaller exterior towns out here and that they had been raised at. And one of the ladies, the, the, like two days before the funeral, went out to the graveyard, and it was full of red ants. <laughs> there were red ant, you know, red ant mounds everywhere. There were weeds everywhere. Everything was terrible. She just, you know, having lived now in Houston for 30 or 40 years, she had forgotten what it was like in East Texas. And so she went in and personally cleaned up that hole. Cemetery. It was a family cemetery, not a big huge cemetery, but a family cemetery. And I, I got tickled at it because I was reading this thing, the same thing. I said, you know, it's sort of the same thing here. There was this motivation to make everything look a bit beautiful on the outside. Nothing wrong with that. That's great. But what are you like on the inside is what Jesus is driving at. You can do all of these out, outward ceremonial things and outward things of respect. But what are you like on the inside? Has God changed your life on the inside? He said, if God had changed, well, let's just put it this way. If you had lived in the days of your forefathers, you say we would not have taken part in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. So you've got, the, you've got like David's tomb. You've got Nathan's tomb, the prophet during David's time. You've got these various tombs there that they would keep up for a thousand years. I mean, it's a thousand years after Nathan. It's five hundred years after Isaiah. It's two. It's like mm, maybe about four hundred years after, uh, like uh, uh, Amos. I, I would imagine. No, no, no. Amos would be before that. Anyway, the, some of the minor prophets. So some of these tombs were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, and for hundreds and hundreds of years. These sons of the prophets, their descendants, had been doing what this lady did. They were cleaning up the graveyard, doing all the things. That, well, if we had been there, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have uh, done what our forefathers did. Kill Isaiah. Remember, he was sawn in half. Uh, run Jeremiah out of town. Uh, throw him down in a well. Uh, all these kind of things that happened to the prophets in the Old, uh, Old Testament. Yeah, we, would, we would never have done that. It's interesting, we project on, uh, upon ourselves things that we think we wouldn't do that was bad. Like, I got a discussion the other day. Well, if I'd been back then and I was the head of the army, I would have never dropped the atomic bomb. That's terrible, you know, nuclear war. We've, we've had a nuclear war. I was getting a discussion about nuclear war. We, we, we would have we never done it. If we, knew, if we knew back then, or if we lived back then, we would have never done that. It's easy for us to prejudge a previous generation, to put our ideas, our knowledge, 
what we know the side effects of things are, what we know today, back on them, at a time of war, which we've never experienced on that scale, the largest massive war, massive deaths in the world happened in that area around World War II and the advance of communism, all kinds of things. Millions and millions of people died. We have no concept. I, I personally don't have any experience of that level of death and that level of heinous uh, political crime. So Monday it's easy for us to say that we wouldn't have done it. Monday morning quarterbacks. Yes, that's, that's what, that's they, right. that's what yes. they were being. They were being Monday morning quarterbacks. And again, patting themselves on the back. All of this was self-indulgence that he talked about. All of this is, my legacy is going to be greater than MacArthur's legacy or whatever. Okay. But Jesus says, you testify against yourselves and your descendants. You are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up in a measure of your sins of your forefathers. She's basically saying, you are just as guilty as they are in what you're doing today. You, have, you haven't been changed spiritually. You snakes. So Jesus, up to this point, look at the words that he's used to describe these people. He's called them hypocrites. He's called them blind people saying, I'm your guide, and let me guide you through uh, Grand Canyon without falling off. I'm blind. I can't see anything. Just follow me, uh, and we'll all fall off the cliff. Okay? You blind leaders of the guide, you sons of hell, Gehenna was the, uh, Gehenna was the, garbage dump of Jerusalem. It's where everybody took their garbage. Remember, there was no running water. There were no toilets. There was no anything. They would save these things up during the day, and then we'd dump them off over the wall into the Valley of Gehenna. So they gave it, the Valley of Gehenna had been there a thousand years. Can you imagine a dump that's a thousand years old that has a thousand years of human waste and excrement and everything like this building up on the outside of town? And it had a smoldering fire. It was just a smoldering fire. There were all kinds of flies, all kinds of maggots and things like that. So when Jesus says that there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, where the worm dieth not, in other words, all these maggots everywhere, and the fire is not quenched, and he uses this term Gehenna to describe hell. So when people say, what is the biblical concept of hell? You know, our biblical concept, our non-biblical concept is just like a gigantic furnace, okay, with lots of fire and everything like that. Jesus pictures it more as the universal garbage dump. You've now become the refuge and the garbage of eternity, and that's the way you're going to be for all eternity. That's, that's a terrible, to me, that's just as bad as the other picture, but it's more realistic as to what, how Jesus was describing hell. Uh, hell is also described to us as outer darkness. What does that mean? Outer darkness. It's almost like you're thrown out in the outer space into an area of the universe where it's uh, garbage dump of the universe. I mean, that's my, I, I'm just letting you, that's my picture of hell. I don't know what your picture of hell is, but that's a terrible place to be. That's the reason why we need to get the gospel out. Because you don't want to spend your life in such a terrible place as this. People always make fun of the concept of hell. You know, I don't mind going to hell. I'll be there with my buddies. And Satan will be there with his big long fork and tail and his, his pitchfork. And we'll all be laughing and getting drunk together. You know, Throw some alcohol on the fire and just build a little bit of beer. I mean, this is, this is the joke that, that, that goes around among non-Christians about hell. And I, Jesus has this picture of it's... It's the place where everything is thrown away. You're going to be forever a thrown away person. Forever you're going to be a, the refuse of eternity. You're going to be in the garbage pit of eternity. It's, it's terrible. Okay. Sons of Gehenna. You're whitewashed. We just talked about that. You're, you're a bunch of whitewashed people. You're the descendants of murderers. We just saw that. Now he's calling them snakes and sons of snakes, okay? That's, I'm, I'm fascinated. He uses terms that border on major insults. If somebody walked up to you and say, you, let's see, you're worse than a copperhead. You're, 
<laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're a rattlesnake, you know, you're, and you, you know, you're the, you're the son or daughter of a rattlesnake, you know, that's kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't know how to handle that. <laughs> when Gene and I were driving back from Houston last night, late last night, we were talking about some verses like this. So we started coming up with crazy analogies of, of how to insult somebody. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we do funny things here. Jean's an English teacher, so she knows all kinds of words I've always since forgotten. And she puts them together in such funny ways. So, Jesus is insulting the fire out of these very highly respected. Remember, these are not people that are not respected by the general population. The general population of Jesus' time put these people up on a pedestal. They were so good and so righteous, I'll never be that good or that righteous. And Jesus brings them down and, and it basically is insulting them to the highest degree. Yeah. You snakes, you <coughs> sons of snakes, that's what brood of vipers mean. But you, you, you sons of snakes, how will you ex escape being condemned to hell? Mm -hmm. Here's this word Gehenna again. To the garbage pit of the universe. How are you going to escape? You're going, in other words, you're going to go to hell yourself. Therefore, I'm sending. You prophets and wise men and teachers, some of them will be killed and crucified and others will be flogged. Matthew remembers this. Remember, Matthew is talking to his own disciples, his own church, let's just put it this way, his own group of believers. They're going to be scattered to the four winds and it's their responsibility to carry out the gospel. And they're going to be persecuted and they're going to be uh, put down. They're going to be uh, shamed publicly. They're going to be beaten, all these kind of things. And Jesus is saying, I'm sending people out today in the same way that I sent out the prophets in the Old Testament. This is one of those places. Uh, this was a highly offensive statement because when he uses the word prophets, their, their view of a prophet was like prophets of the Old Testament. Yahweh is who sent the prophets out in the Old Testament. Here Jesus is saying, I'm the one that sends the prophets out. I'm the one that sends these people out. Jesus is putting himself on the level of God here. Mm -hmm. It's indirect. It's not a direct statement, but it really is upsetting the Pharisees. I'm going to be sending prophets. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Yeah. You will flog them in your synagogues, pursue them from town to town. So upon you will come the righteous blood that has been shed on this earth from the blood of Abel. That was the first person to be murdered in the Bible. Remember Cain and Abel? Cain killed Abel, his brother. You know, uh, am I my brother's keeper? It comes from that passage of scripture. Uh, uh, righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Bar Barakiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Jesus is describing the last murder mentioned in the Old Testament as the Old Testament was compiled in his day. In Jesus' day, same Old Testament we have, but the, but the uh, books are arranged in a different way. If you get a Jewish Bible, if you go to a Jewish bookstore and get a Jewish Bible, it's our Old Testament. If it's translated into English, you read it, it's our Old Testament. But the order of the books is different. You look at them and say, what? Where, you know, where's, where's Psalms? Where's Proverbs? Where are they? They're there. It's just they're not where they are in our Bible. It's just a rearrangement. And the Chronicles is at the end of their Bible. This sounds strange for Chronicles to be it. But in 2 Chronicles, if you read 2 Chronicles, you'll see this event. The last murder mentioned in the Old Testament. So Jesus is talking about the fact he's, he's getting the whole sweep of the Jewish nation, the whole sweep of the Bible as they had it in the first century. The Old Testament, the whole Old Testament from the beginning of mankind to the day that the Old Testament was finalized, there's just been murder. People killing other people. And you, because it's the book of the Jewish nation, and you consider yourselves the, the leaders of the Jewish nation, you've allowed this kind of stuff to happen. All their blood is on your hands. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. So think about it. When Jesus uses the word generation, he's talking about the Jewish people. 
This is going to be extremely important when we get into the prophecies about Jesus' second coming. When he says it's going to come upon this generation, he's talking about the Jewish people, that generation. He's talking deliberately about Jews. Let's just put it this way. He's talking specifically about the nation and the land and the uh, constitution, uh, the political constitution of the people we call Jews or Israel. So when we read these things where Jesus said this generation will not pass away until you see the coming of Jesus Christ, he's talking about the Jewish people. There are a lot of people that see that the generation, using our concept of generation, our generation uh, is, you know, there's been thousands, or not a thousand, there's been a hundred generations between Jesus' being on this earth and today. There's a hundred generations. So that first, this generation, he says, this generation will pass away until all these are fulfilled. Well, Jesus has to come back. They'll use that as a write-off of Jesus. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that the Jewish people will exist as a nation when I come back. And that has never happened until 1948, 47, 48, when the Jewish nation came back together in unbelief, like the Bible says in Ezekiel, it says when God brings them from the four corners of the earth and they come back to Israel, they will be mainly an unbelieving group of people who won't believe like their forefathers did in God. That's exactly a description of the way Israel is today. But that generation is not going to be, it's going to be around. <laughs> I get excited, I'm sorry, I get excited about this because it, t it tells me that Jesus knows, well, God knows when he's coming back. Jesus is getting ready. It has something to do with the reestablishment of Israel. We live in that day, and I hope to see the coming of the Lord. My dad did too. But, and I may pass away, get, you know, along to the four corners of the earth, uh, and whatever thing, but when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back to not Washington, D.C., not Moscow, Russia. He's going to come back to Jerusalem, it says. He will descend, and when he, he will descend right on the Mount of Olives, which is the mountain outside, right outside of Jerusalem. And the Bible says it will split when he touches down. I take that literally. What will split? The Mount of Olives. In Zechariah, when it says, when the Messiah descends from heaven and touches the Mount of Olives, it will split in half. What is the Mount of Olives? The Mount of Olives I mean, is... I know what it is, but is it a mountain? Uh, it's more like a big hill, you know. It is? Yeah. But we would say, you know, compared to the Rocky Mountains, we'd say this is a big hill. But they called everything Mount. Mount Moriah is Jerusalem. If you look at Jerusalem, it's on a height. We would call it the heights of Zion. But they call it Mount Zion or Mount Moriah. That's the way they looked at mountains. Okay? I'm just doing that. It's like calling... Uh, the Sea of Galilee, a sea. Luke even doesn't even want to use the term. Luke is used to traveling the Mediterranean, and he's probably even seen the Atlantic Ocean from you know the uh, from Gibraltar. You think he's really talking about splitting? I mean, the mountain will just split. I think so. And let me tell you the reason why. This is, we're we're going to get into the the second coming of Jesus in the next chapter, so we might as well jump into it now. When you read the prophecies in the Old Testament about the first coming of Jesus, they're literal. He was born of a virgin. The Bible said in the Old Testament, he was born of a virgin. That's pretty hard to believe. The Bible says he'd be born in Bethlehem. That's pretty specific. The Bible says uh, that he's going to suffer for the sins of mankind. That's Isaiah 53. That's pretty literal. Why should we then not believe that the prophecies about the second coming are not real? <coughs> I don't understand. There are, by the way, there are a lot of Christian denominations that love Jesus, who are saved. I'm not here to <coughs> fault that. All it takes, remember I said, all it takes to be saved is to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You may have some crazy <laughs> theological views, but if Jesus is the Lord of your life, the Bible says you're saved. 
So there are going to be some people who are going to be really surprised when they get to heaven. I'll probably be surprised when they get to heaven too. That's okay. Uh, but I, this is one fascinating thing about some of these other denominations is that they have metaphorized all the scriptures about the second kingdom of Jesus and just simply say, well, there's not going to be any Jesus descending from heaven and landing on Mount, Mount of Olives, splitting in half, and then riding into Jerusalem, the Golden Gate, which is now sealed. The Arabs sealed off the Golden Gate to prevent they, the, the Arabs did they know they knew the Bible better than we did. The, the Islam. The Islamists knew the Bible better than we did. So when the, the gates of Jerusalem were rebuilt and the Golden Gate was there, they sealed it up. Because they literally believe that Jesus is going to walk through it. Now, is a, is, is a bunch of bricks going to stop Jesus? I don't think so. I think he's, he's the power of God. As he comes in, if that, that, that Golden Gate is sealed in, it just goes boom. All those bricks will fall out and it's come on through. That's great. So, uh, uh, but I take the, 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 the descriptions in the Old and New Testament about the second coming of Jesus Christ as literal, I don't say more literal than, but as literal as the prophecies of his first coming. And it says that the Mount of Olives was split in half, north to south. Zachari it's in Zechariah someplace, I can't remember where. Cool. Okay, let's go. Uh, you snakes, you know oh, I've already been that, haven't I? Yeah. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, think about this. He is talking to the same group of people. The people he has called hypocrites, blind, sons of Gehenna, whitewashed, going to hell, descendants of murderers, snakes, sons of snakes. He's called them all these things. Now what does he say? Listen to him. He's talking to them. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They are, they are members of the elite of Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Uh, that is, uh, if you've ever watched a bird, let's say a, a hawk or some big, bigger bird, some uh, uh, you know, bird of prey, comes flying over and you got a mother hen on the ground. Have you ever seen them? All the little chicks run towards the mother hen and boom, she's got her, she's got her wings over them and protecting. That's, that's the picture here. God loves us. God has this open invitation. Come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come under my wings. That's a, that's, that is right straight out of the Psalms where it says, that we want to be under the wings of the Almighty. Come unto me, and I'm all the wonderful things I would have done for you, but you, it's your will, you did not want to do it. Look, your house is left desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Every festival, they, that's one of the ascent psalms. Uh, I think it's about mm, Psalm 105 or something like that. I can't, I'm, I'm ballparking with people. But the ascent psalms were the psalms that were sung as people marched into Jerusalem. And just like they set aside a table in their, uh, in their, their celebration of Passover, they set, they set aside a seat for Elijah, even though Elijah's not there, in hopes that Elijah will be there. They sing this psalm, which is about the return of the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Is talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. They are away. Of course, they don't even think that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. So they're waiting for the first coming. We're talking about Jews now. They're waiting for the first coming of the Messiah. And so they sing this song, one of the psalms of the Old Testament, that says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus says, That's right. You're not going to see me again. And now, obviously, they're going to see him with his crucifixion and things like that. He's talking generically about the fact that this is the last time you're going to see me. I'm going to be out of here. Which he was 40 days later. He's sitting in heaven. 
you're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That means that there will be a day that the Jewish people realize that Jesus was and is their true Messiah. They do not believe that. Right now. Jews many times use Jesus' name as a curse word. They love to use Jesus' name as a curse word uh, in the past. I don't know about now, but in the past. So at this particular point in time, there has got to be a transformation in, the, in this generation, the nation of Israel, in which they start re realizing that Jesus was their first true, first, first and only Messiah, right. that he came 2,000 years ago. And they begin singing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to Jesus. That has not happened yet. Here's a prophecy about the second coming of Jesus that obviously hasn't happened yet. But as more and more Jews start turning to Jesus Christ, that there are a small group of them. I don't know if, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Zola Levitt used to come here years ago. And he's a Jewish messianic. They call them messianic Jews. Who, Jews who believe in Jesus as Messiah. Still live as Jews. Still celebrate this Passover. Still uh, uh, celebrate Yom Kippur. Still celebrate the old Jewish customs. But they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That group is getting larger and larger. Not rapidly, but it's expanding. And one of these days when it encompasses the whole nation, the Bible says, that will be the time you better start looking up because Jesus is... Get ready to arrive. Okay, let's get into the next chapter. Jesus left the temple. So this passage of scripture right here is vitally connected to this next passage. You can see the transition right here. He's talking about his second coming. It's vitally related to that, and now he's going to get into the concept of the second coming. Jesus left the temple, was walking with his disciples. They came up to him and called his attention to these beautiful buildings. The temple was one, could have been one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, it was built by Herod, if you, uh, Herod the Great. If you look at the blocks that are in them, they're larger than the blocks that are in the, uh, the blocks of stone, blocks of granite, larger than the blocks that are used in the pyramids. They're huge. Some, I think one of them is 40 feet long. We still do not know how they transported that block from the quarry up the mountain. Remember, it's on Mount Moriah. Up the mountain to that flat plain. Mount Moriah was shaved off at the top. And that's the, that is the plain upon which the temple sat. And the temple sat over the rock. There's a huge rock there. And that rock, which is now under the dome of the rock, which is now an Arab territory, or uh, Islamic territory, <coughs> that rock was supposedly where Abraham sacrificed, or was going to sacrifice our husband. So this has got some very long-term traditional views of, uh, and passions of people, religious people, both Muslims and Christians and Arabs, uh, and probably and Jews. So they all focus on this one point because we are we 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 are the sons and daughters of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. That's Galatians. If you read the book of Galatians, it says that you as a Christian are a son and daughter spiritually of Abraham. Muslims believe that they descended from Abraham through uh, Isaac and Ishmael through Ishmael. Jews believe they are the sons and daughters of Abraham, and they descended through Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob is Israel. So they, so it, it says here that they're looking at this huge, beautiful building that was still under construction, by the way, in Jesus' day. But they had been working on it for 40 years, and they still weren't finished. In fact, they won't be finished even in 70 AD, it won't be fully finished with the building out the temple until it's actually torn <coughs> by, the, by, the, by the Russians. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, by the Romans. <laughs> I've been, yeah, it's too political these days. <laughs> by the Romans. It's going to be destroyed in 70 AD. It was started like, I don't know, what, 40, 40, 30. 
and it had been started like in 10 or 15 BC. I can't remember when. Uh, but it had been started, then, and it was 40 years in its building right here. It's, it's, they've been building, working on it for 40 years. It's absolutely beautiful. They said that it was, uh, that when the sun shone on it, it looked like a beautiful white, uh, like a lighthouse as the sun, sun shone on it. And the gold that trimmed it also was beautiful. You could see it for miles. It was gorgeous. To tear down something... You ever tried to tear up a rock, especially a big no. slab? You can see these rocks. They didn't, they they didn't push break the off. rocks down. They just simply pushed them over the side of the, the mountain, the hill. So when Jesus says one stone is left, not left upon another, he means up on the top where the slab is. There are stones, and they are left on top of each other, but they've been pushed over the side of the mountain. They're down in the valley. So he's talking about the building itself up there. Nothing is going to be there, and there's nothing of the temple. In fact, is that's the reason why the Arabs say the temple was never here, even though the blocks for it are laid right there in the valley. So, uh, so Jesus, notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, "Do you see all these things? I tell you the truth: not one stone will be left another. Everything is going to be thrown down." Which is really a good description of what had happened. They pushed those things over the side of the mountain, and they rolled down into the valley below, Kidron Valley. As Jesus was sitting on Mount Olives, now he's cross. So they're coming out of the temple. They're heading towards the Mount of Olives. They go down through the Kidron Valley. They're now back up on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately because, remember, he had been with multitudes, huge crowds, tens of thousands of people inside of the temple. And he had talked with the leaders of all these people for chapter 23, got a big stir out of that, and now they've left the temple, they've gone down the valley, they're up on the Mount of Olives, where they are encamped. They're, they're, that, that, which is what they did. They camped there, and uh, they're private with Jesus. They came to Jesus privately and said, tell us then, when will this happen? That is, when will the temple be torn down? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age. Okay, they believed in a second. At this time, the disciples were getting the idea that Jesus is coming somehow. Now, their view is that Jesus, they don't believe Jesus is going to die. They believe that his, his uh, followers are getting larger and larger and larger, and that he will come into Jerusalem, just like it describes, like I described in uh, Zechariah. So they're expecting, but they want to know when it's going to happen. When you start interpreting the scriptures, you've got to you've got to let scripture interpret scripture, and you've got to re, uh, I'll just put it this way: you need to reread the passage that you are interpreting multiple times. And you will hear even people say, "Get a couple of different translations, read the same same thing in multiple translations." They are asking him two questions, not one question, but two. When will this happen? That is, when will the temple be torn down? That's what he just there. That's what they're referring back to. And the second question is, what will be the sign of the second coming of Jesus? Okay. Basically, that's it. We're talking about two separate events. There are some denominations and some liber super liberals who believe that. When Jerusalem was destroyed, that was the second coming of Jesus. There are some others who believe that when the day of Pentecost happened and, and the di disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost, that that was the second coming of Jesus. And I, I'm, I know I'm feeding you a lot of wrong theology here. But there are people, there are different denominations, different groups who build entire theological, their entire theological framework is built on the fact that there will be no literal second coming of Jesus. Jesus is not going to descend on a cloud in the sky and touch down in Jerusalem and reign from Jerusalem halfway around the world for a thousand years, the millennium. There are people who do not, they're Christian, good Christians who love Jesus, who do not believe it. Okay? When they read this, they read it as if it's one question. 
what, when will you tear down the temple and what will be the sign of your coming? And, and they confuse the two. That is the sign of his coming, the tearing down of the temple. This is, that's where they get this idea. That's not what is here. Jesus is talking about two questions. Our disciples are asking him two questions and they're running the sentence together. What, when, when is this going to happen? When is going to the, t the temple going to be destroyed? And then, what is the sign of your second coming? Two separate questions. Because if you get those confused, you're going to be like the group that believes that the second coming was tearing down the temple. And therefore, it's a spiritual coming. There are many, there, there are some, not even denominations, there are Christian cults who believe that Jesus came in, what, 1840-something, there's another, there's another cult that believes that Jesus came in 1914 during World War, II, World War I because that's when the cult was formed. Uh, and they all believe it was an invisible coming. Nobody saw it. The Bible says every eye will see him when he comes back. How they get around it, I don't know. And that, that, was, one, that was another reason why a hundred years ago people said you can't believe in the fact that Jesus is coming because you can't take the you cannot take the prophecies about a second coming literally because it's impossible for everybody around the world to see an event happen at the same time they're not there in Jerusalem. Not anymore. Not anymore. We've got satellite, you got CNN, you got Fox News cameras. You can see instantaneously. You got people with cell phones now. It's just. Here's my own television station, and they're dumping live feed up on the up on the internet. Everybody in the world right now have well, not everybody, but most nations in the world right now have access to seeing an event on the earth happening simultaneously. That couldn't happen until maybe about what, 15 years ago, when, right. when the internet took off and uh, people could do that. And then, of course, maybe. Ten years before that, there was satellite television, things like that. So we live in a day where these prophecies make sense. Whereas, even 50 years ago, some people were denying the literal translation of these because they said it's impossible. Right. Like there were some uh, prophets that were going to be killed in the streets and they were going to rise yes. body and yeah. soul and send into heaven and said the world will see it. The world will see it. You know, so and then they would laugh at that. See, this has know, got to be some sort of uh, metaphysical... Uh, metaphorical explanation of some events that may have happened in Jesus' day or John's day. And he's just attacking the Romans. He doesn't like Caesar. He's half crazy in a cave. That's the way they... There are, there are Christians who believe that about the book of Revelation. But as I read it, I'd say these things may have been impossible 20 or 30 years ago, 50 years ago, but they're not impossible now. Yeah. So we're living in a day where we're seeing more and more of these prophecies literally be possibly fulfilled. The nation of Israel is literally being fulfilled. that are coming down. There's one prophecy in the Bible that talks about the area around uh, Damascus being leveled. Uh, I find this fascinating. I, I, 50 years ago I got a discussion about the literal, literal nature of prophecies in the Old Testament. It says this prophecy has never happened. Damascus has always been a city. It has never been destroyed, leveled to the ground, or anything like that in, in the area around Damascus. And I would like to talk to that guy today and ask him that same question. So what do you think about the area around Damascus and Aleppo right now? Yeah. Uh, so, it's, uh, well, sorry. Okay, we might as well stop here. Right? Uh, so we'll pick up about this because Jesus is now going to start talking about his second coming. Matthew answers the second question. The book of Luke answers the first question. Okay. Well, I was trying to get to this. That the book of Luke goes into a beautiful description of the destruction of the temple. Matthew goes into a beautiful description of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So, it's, it's not that Jesus doesn't answer the question. It's just that two different disciples wrote about two different answers. They look like two different answers. One was talking about the temple being destroyed in 70 AD, and the other talks about the second coming of Jesus. Now, there's some overlap, but I'm talking about the majority of this event. So, 
read the same passage of scripture in Luke and you'll see there are some things there where he says flee to the hills and all this kind of stuff and, he, and there are some people who get all mixed up about the second coming of Jesus when it was talking about you better flee to the hills when you start seeing the temple being destroyed Where, whereas Matthew strictly sticks well not strictly he, he does talk about the destruction of the temple but that's not the majority. He spends most of his time talking about the second coming. Father, we thank you so very much about your wonderful word, what you've said here. Lord, prepare us for your coming because you said that people who are saved are looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I know some people have some odd ideas about your second coming, but I don't care. As a Christian, we want to be with Jesus Christ and we know that his return is coming, and Lord, even so come quickly. We ask for your return as soon as possible. Our earth is in a real mess. Uh, so, uh, Lord, we trust this all to you in your time. In Jesus' name.